Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our session for today. Um, if you would please just take a moment to read the PowerPoint that you see in front of you. It's a slide that just gives you a little bit of housekeeping information. Um, please keep in mind that today's sessions will be recorded and we'll share those recordings within about two weeks after this conference is ended. If you haven't already, there are presentation materials that are available on the landing page, so feel free to download those and follow along. And please remember to use the Q&A box to submit any questions to our speakers today and to respond to any questions that they may ask you in the chat or to even just list any of those comments or questions that you may have as well, feel free to use the chat box for that. Thank you again. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our speakers for today. All right. Well, thanks, Lene, for introducing us and thank all of you for being here. Uh, we're excited to be here with you and to be presenting to you today on leveraging a strengths first mindset and uh, truly an honor, privilege and, and blessing to be here with all of you. So uh, I, I think we'll just start with a, a quick word of prayer and, and get moving here. So dear Heavenly Father, we ask for your blessings upon our session today. Allow us to see again how we are fearfully and wonderfully made and how we can use our strengths, the gifts that you've given to us, uh, to better serve the kingdom and all of the good works that you've prepared in advance for us to do. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. And we move forward here into our next introductory slide. Of, again, introducing ourselves uh, for a second here with myself being Scott Goschak. I, background in urban education, Milwaukee, Atlanta, Minneapolis, uh, leadership development and training. So again, privileged to be here with all of you today and my partner, Tiffany Wigan. Hello, my name is Tiffany Wigand. I am in the Milwaukee area as well. I am a lifelong Wells member. I grew up in the church. My undergrad degree was in marketing, and that is something that I never thought I would get out of. However, when I was blessed enough to be hired by some ministries that were near and dear to my heart, I was so thankful to help them with marketing. But in one organization in particular, I realized as soon as I got hired that I was hired to basically be a Band-Aid for a gushing wound. Uh, and it, it was at that point that I realized that marketing wasn't necessarily getting to the root cause of everything. And at that time, I was introduced to strengths, which is what we'll be talking about today and seeing how this can really help get to the root cause of so many issues with many ministries. And I think it ties in really well with a lot of what you've heard the last two days from the Seabrook Conference as well, talking about having positive conflict and, and overcoming some of those challenges. So excited to be with you today. So I'm actually going to challenge you to take the word weakness out of your vocabulary and replace it with partner up opportunities. Now, obviously we don't know everybody who's here. We don't know what, if you've ever taken the Clifton Strengths Assessment or not. Uh, so we realize that uh, some of you may have seen some of this information before and some of you might be saying, what is this Strengths Assessment that we're talking about? So Gallup has an assessment called Clifton Strengths, formerly Strengths Finder. You can take the assessment and find out what your top strengths are. And from there, that's where we dig into what we're going to be talking about later. But for you, for me, you might be saying, well, why is this important? So we jokingly say that people like myself who have the strength of analytical have never grown out of our two-year-old phase of asking why. Why is this relevant? Why is this topic being even discussed? So what you'll see on the screen here are two different studies that Gallup has conducted that, have, are, that are overlaid in this bar chart. So the first thing I want you to look at is the lighter blue or the turquoise color, which says engaged. So obviously this has nothing to do with marriage. This is saying that three out of 10 employees throughout the United States are engaged in their job. So these people love their job. They're the brand ambassadors. They go above and beyond. They'll put in the extra hours because they really believe in it. Then the not engaged at 53%. These are the people that, you know what? We all have bills to pay. We want a roof over our head. We want food. They're just going to work to collect a paycheck, right? They're not necessarily hurting anything, but they're not pushing the mission forward. And then we have actively disengaged, which is at 17%. These are the, are the saboteurs. Not only are they not happy, they're making sure that they're wasting everybody else's time and bringing them down as well. It creates somewhat of a toxic environment. Now let's think about what happens when individuals and organizations and leaders work from their strengths. 
Engagement skyrockets from 30% all the way to 73%. Not engaged goes from 53 to 26%. And actively dis disengaged goes from 17% down to 1%. So it's statistically insignificant. It can never be to zero. Now you might be saying, well, this is great, but how does this really apply to my ministry? So this study was done across all industries, but let's take it to the ministry. Let's take it to your church. Let's think about this. Three out of 10 of your members or individuals in your organization are doing the bulk of the work, right? They're the ones that are coming to church every Sunday, volunteering for everything because they really truly care about everything that's happening and they wanna support it. And then 53% with not, 53 not engaged, right? These are the people that maybe they're coming to church most Sundays, they're coming to church late, leaving early. They're not really doing anything else. And then actively disengaged, these are maybe the C and E Christians, right? Christmas and Easter, or, you know, they're just coming once in a while. And when they come, all they do is talk bad about it. They're just not happy with everything that's going on. Well, if you can get individuals in your congregation to switch to think about strengths to say, how can we bring you in based on strengths? How much more could your ministry accomplish if 43% more of your members or your volunteers were more engaged in what's going on? So that's why we're here today to talk to you about strengths. So once you take the Clifton Strengths Assessment, it is not a one and done, right? It is just the first step of a long journey. Um, and, and like I said, we want you to take the word weakness out of your vocabulary. So it's not saying that you don't have to worry about your weaknesses. You don't always have to, you don't have to worry about developing yourself, but I want you to develop yourself based on strengths. So once you understand what your top five or your top eight strengths are, now how can you develop yourself? How can you make sure that you're looking at your strengths to say, how can I use them more? How can I understand them better? And get really curious about that. And with that, within your ministries, saying, how can we make sure that we're bringing in diversity in roles and in positions to say, we want diversity of thought, diversity of strength, perspective. So as we're putting together project teams or committees or hiring new individuals and building those teams, we're making sure we have that diverse of, diversity of strengths. So I want to take a step back and talk about the difference between a talent and a strength. So you're going to hear us talk about the word strength, but really it, it roots back to how we were born. So we are born with innate talents. So it's this natural ability, this recurring pattern of thought, feeling, or belief, uh, and it's productively applied, right? And then over time, as we develop those talents, right, with education, with experience, it becomes a strength. So when it's a strength, it's consistent, near-perfect performance in an activity. So there's one strength called WU, which stands for winning others over. And the talent of Wu is to naturally meet people, right? Starting conversations with people and not having that fear of starting a conversation with a stranger. When it becomes a strength, the person who has Wu can purposely meet with people to network with them and connect them to other people. So again, thinking about your, your ministry, your congregation, the individuals who have Wu are meeting and greeting everybody. They notice people they haven't met yet. They introduce themselves, make them feel welcome. And then they introduce them to other people that they think they could benefit from meeting with. But it doesn't just start with, just stay with the individual. Now, once we understand ourselves, we want to say, how can we have an effective team? And guess what? We're going to keep throwing out different things that maybe challenge the status quo. But I don't want you to be well-rounded, right? I actually don't. I want you to really understand your top strengths, your top five, your top eight strengths, and really own it and say, this is what I'm good at. This is the value that I'm going to bring to an organization. And then from there, guess what? Where those, those strengths stop, you're kind of edgy. But just like a puzzle, you're going to butt up against other individuals who have different strengths. And so instead of you being well-rounded, I want the team to be well-rounded, right? We were not created to be alone. So how can we find other individuals and partner up with each other? So some of you, whether you've taken Clifton Strengths assessment or not, may be familiar with other assessments that are out there. And you might be thinking, well, why this one? Well, there are a lot of assessments out there and they all have their benefit, but there are two key reasons that we love Clifton Strengths. The first one is it focuses on positive psychology. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, right? God has a purpose for us. So let's focus on the strengths that he has given us so we can work through that and find our purpose. And the second one is it showcases how unique we truly are. There is a one in 33 million chance of you and I having the same top five in the same order. People are not replaceable. Positions are what's replaceable. So with that, I'll turn it over to Scott. So the 80-20 rule is simply that your top five strengths make up about 80% of what you do naturally. So usually we go to numbers six, seven, and eight in our assessments because that kind of rounds things out to take it about the 98% uh, operationally. So again, the top five make about 80%. 
but 80% is nature, just how God created us. About 20% it can be societal influences around us, how we were raised, our parents, our upbringing, our areas, wherever it might be. And strengths really do not change. We, we are who God created us to be. So we're going to encourage you to embrace those strengths and to live forward in those, to use those as fully as possible uh, to, again, be the, the best that you can be out of service and out of love for God, who, again, has fearfully and wonderfully made you. But strengths are just one piece of the puzzle. So we need to understand that there are other areas in here. So a lot of times when we say uh, we want you to take weakness out of your vocabulary, people will say, well, isn't sin a weakness? Isn't, you know, that all the, absolutely, absolutely. But it's not a sin to not have certain strengths in your top five, top eight. But again, where Satan wants to attack us is in this pyramid. He wants to get us off of those high quality values. And the fact that we're Christians and we have the values that we are redeemed, loved children of God, we're built on those solid values, those biblical principles to, to lift us forward, that, that love of God motivating us to do all things for others. And then really the fruits of the spirit, the virtues being shown. So again, we want that prudence, justice, fortitude, faith, hope, love, uh, the, the, the list can go on to those positive virtues that can come out, those fruits of the spirit that should be displayed. So again, we're built on those solid values. We have that display of the fruits of the spirit. And then again, where we get attacked is we'll be attacked spiritually, emotionally, physically. So again, we teach that you need to be spiritually, emotionally, physically resilient. So spiritually, being in the word uh, daily, prayer life, uh, church attendance, Bible studies, whatever it might be, to strengthen yourself spiritually, because there's nothing better that, that Satan wants to do is to take us away from that spiritual base, to take us away from that word of God. And then emotionally, we all get attacked emotionally by things such as jealousy, envy, greed, anger management, anxiety, whatever it might be, fear, self-doubt, self-hatred. So all of those different things. So we, we need to be in control of our emotions and not our emotions controlling us. So being emotionally resilient and then also physically resilient, getting good sleep, exercise, nutrition. All of you know that if you go to the office and you're battling a headache or a cold or whatever it might be, you're not going to be as fully functioning as you are on days where you're feeling physically well. So again, getting good sleep, exercise, nutrition, et cetera. So we're going to encourage you to be built on those solid values, uh, the fruits of the spirit being displayed, those positive virtues, be strong spiritually, emotionally, physically, strengthen your strengths and watch how God blesses you through all of that. And then just like, just like, again, Jesus came to serve and not to be served. It's the same for us. We want to use our strengths to help others use their strengths to help others use their strengths. And now we've got that synergy, that unity of the body working together. So again, it's not about me using my strengths to make someone to be like me, to make a mini me. As a parent, I used to tell my children, it's so much easier if you just do it the way I do it. Well, in reality, it wasn't. It's easier now that I understand strengths for them to do things through their strengths to help me use my strengths to help others use their strengths. And we have that unity of the body of Christ working together. All right, so I have an activity for you and I know I can't see you, so I'm gonna hope that you guys are doing this. Hopefully you have a piece of paper in front of you. What I'd like you to do is grab a piece of paper and a pen or some writing utensil and I want you to sign your name as quickly and neatly as possible when I tell you to. So again, grab your paper, grab your pen, get ready to sign your name as quickly and neatly as possible. And I'm gonna do this with you just for fun. And I'm going to time you. So that's why I don't want you to do, to do it just yet. All right. So on your mark, get set, go. All right. So if you have a longer name, it might take you a little bit longer, but it just took me a couple seconds. And there, I signed my name. Pretty easy, right? Looks, looks like I wanted it to, no problem. Well, here's the thing. I want you to do it again now, but I want you to do it faster and neater again when I tell you to go. So get ready. Oh, by the way, before you get started, I want you to put your pen in your other hand. So that's right. I want you to put your pen in your non-dominant hand. So again, sign your name as quickly and neatly as possible with your non-dominant hand. On your mark, get set, go. All right, so I know that some of you are probably still going on. So it took me more than twice the amount of time to do it. And uh, let's see if you guys can see this. 
The first one was pretty easy, right? The second one, a little bit tougher. I don't know about you, but I kind of felt like I went back to first grade and I was just learning to write, right? Doesn't look, doesn't look that great, uh, not too legible. Um, I've been doing this a few times though, so I feel like I've gotten a little bit better, but it's taking me longer. I have to really concentrate when I'm doing it. So it's a really simple ex exercise to say, think about this with your strengths as well. So for me, I'm right-handed. So if I write with my right-handed, I can have a conversation while I'm doing it. Sometimes I can write with my eyes closed, right? But if I have to do it with my left hand, it's going to be like, all right, every silence, I can't, you know, I'm going to tune you all out. I really have to focus on this. The same with strengths. So if you're working from your strengths, it's what you do naturally. You do it without thinking. And because you're doing it without thinking, it just, it takes less energy, right? So you can do more. You can be, you can be quicker at it. You enjoy it. And you're really engaged in what you're doing. But if you're working from outside of your strengths, you can do it, right? But it's just going to take more energy. So that's why we teach energy management instead of time management, okay? So when you think about energy, you wake up in the morning, hopefully you had a good night's sleep and, and your cup is full. You know, you're, 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 you have a full tank of gas, right? You're over here. And then throughout the day, if you're working from your strengths, you're, you're only taking a little bit of gas, right? You're, you're still staying energized. Whereas if you're working outside of your strengths constantly, you're going to be on this side of the the aisle here, this where you're almost empty. So here's an example that I give. So Scott and I have been working together for a few years now, and we often talk about Excel spreadsheets, right? So in your ministry, maybe you're using Excel spreadsheets because you want to track attendance. You want to track all sorts of things. Just kind of say, okay, well, what seems to be working? What's doing well? How can we just keep track of what we're doing? All right. Well, when it comes to Excel spreadsheets, I love them, okay? I have the strength of analytical. I love to ask why, I love to get into the data. So for me, when I'm working with an Excel spreadsheet, I have a full tank of gas because it only takes me 10 to 20% effort to get 80 to 90% of the results done, no problem. Now, Scott will tell you, if I give this project to him, he will do it, right? It's his job, he's tasked to do it, he's gonna get it done. But he might open up Microsoft Word He'll get out his calculator. He'll tabulate all sorts of stuff, right? He's going to take 80 to 90% effort or energy to get 10 to 20% of the results done. So we really learn to say, well, what am I good at? And what is he really good at? And how can we adjust what we're doing so we're both energized with what we're working on? So Scott, I'll turn it back over. And it's, again, we teach it's what versus how. So again, uh, many times assessments will try to pigeonhole you, lock you into a certain way to do things. And, and that's just, that's a misuse of those assessments. So we teach, again, it's not the what, it's the how. So again, it's not what you're doing. So there's no top five strengths, top eight strengths to make a better pastor, teacher, leader, mother, father, son, daughter, but they inform how we're going to best operate. So again, we want to look through the lens of our strengths and to say, how can I best approach this position, my role as a father, as a mother, as a son, a daughter, uh, this situation, this team. So again, it's always about the how. So strengths do not, do not limit you to what you can do, but they give you a good lens and perspective to say, how can I use my strengths? Now you may self-select. So for example, as Tiffany was talking, if I'm gonna be in a position that is gonna ask me to be working with Excel spreadsheets and data analysis and all of those things, I can do it, but it's going to take all my energy. So I may look through the lens of my strengths and self-select and say, with my strengths and the way that I'm wired, the way that God has created me, I'm, I'm not going to you take on that position, that role. So again, it's always about the how. How can I use my strengths in whatever role God is placing me in and using me? So the how rather than the what. And now we're going to get into what makes us unique. Uh, partner to learn uh, with partners of ours and, again, associates with research that's been done with all of us, we've developed these eight categories. Gallup breaks the strengths into four categories, influencing, executing, strategic, and relational. Those four categories are fine, but they're pretty nebulous in nature, hard to see how it all fits. So, again, through the research of partners of ours and, and others and some work that we've done, we've developed these eight categories. So we're going to walk you through what these eight categories mean and how you can use these in your ministry. And again, if there's anyone out there with questions and things like that, just please put them in the Q&A and Linnea will let us know and we'll be happy to address those as we go forward. But here we go. We're going to go into the eight categories and Tiffany's going to lead us off. 
the first category is attraction. So attraction strengths are all about getting things started. So think about at church, you're working in the committee and you're saying, okay, we need to do something different, right? COVID was a perfect example where it really kickstarted it to say, we need to figure out how to go online. So individuals who have traction are saying, okay, let's move away from talking about something and brainstorming to actually Im implementing it. So my number one strength is focus. I'm all about setting a goal and working towards it. So in my experience, I've worked on committees at church where uh, I was working with a women's group and I was, I was asked to join because they said, all we do is we just keep talking about different things and we find ourselves talking about the same things over and over every month. Can you come in and really help us get started? So I did. I was a part of the organization for a while. I really helped them say, okay, when it comes to marketing, maybe instead of just making guesses as, as to what people want, we should survey them. And then we did. And then from that information, we said, okay, well, what is this survey telling us? Now it's giving us some traction to say, this is the one event we should really be focusing on. However, it got to a point where I felt like I, after a while, I wasn't really able to use my traction strength. So I wanted to say, okay, well, how can I use my gifts somewhere else, somewhere else where they need me to help them get started? Because at that point, we wanted to partner up with individuals who have driving strengths. So now that we had that event started, we're going to partner up with the drivers to say, okay, now we know what we need to get done. Let's get going. You know, let's work on that to-do list. So individuals, for example, who have Achiever, they live by to-do lists. They love to say maybe they have the daily to-do list, the weekly to-do list, uh, a yearly to-do list, a personal and professional. And for them, if they have a project, right, think about the people in your ministry. They're the ones that are saying, okay, we've got an event coming up. I can take care of all the details to prepare for it, or I can make sure that I'm there to make sure it's running as smoothly as possible. Those are the, the go-to people that you're typically saying, okay, where do I go for this? How can I help you? Just, just tell me what you want me to do. Now, if you are an achiever, they're constantly living in the next moment, right? So if you have achiever, you're already thinking, oh, I hope Tiffany and Scott finish a little bit early because I want to focus on something else real quick, respond to a couple emails, whatever it might be. So traction loves to start, driving loves to finish. But guess what? It might not be the right thing and it might not be the right time. So we want to make sure that we're also partnering up with individuals who have seeing strengths. Seeing strengths bring sight to say, are we in alignment? Are we in alignment with our mission, our vision, and our values? Is this something that we should be doing right now? Maybe later or not at all. So for example, somebody who has the strength of strategic is very quickly thinking out one to three years, right? They're the ones that love to put together the, the sessions to say, what should our strategic plan be? Where does our church want to be? What new initiatives do we want to have? You know, what changes do we want to have implemented by then? And then you might have individuals who have futuristic. Futuristic, they're thinking over the mountains. They're thinking out 5, 10, 15 years. They're the visionaries, right? They're the ones that say, I have a really cool idea and I bet it's going to scare some of you, but just hear me out. Okay, so people who have strategic are going to maybe put together that strategic plan for your ministry and the futuristic is going to stretch you to say let's let's shoot for something that really feels unattainable right now, but let's just try it if we get it amazing let's celebrate and if we don't reach it guess what we probably got pretty close so let's celebrate with that as well. But then we also have individuals who have analytical. So analytical is a seeing strength that we get into the data. We analyze all this information and we know that what we need to do today, tomorrow, and the next day so we can reach that, st that strategy and re reach that vision. Then we also have individuals who have contacts who are thinking about the past. They're very reflective in nature to say, well, let's, let's look at to see what we did in the past, what worked well, what didn't, and guess what? We wanna make sure that we're not repeating past mistakes. So the idea of failing forward. So now that we start and finish things that are in alignment with our mission and done at the right time, well, every organization is really all about people, right? So when it comes to interpersonal strengths, we wanna think about all the different vari variations that we have. So we touched on woo, right? So if you think of your ministry, having an event, the person who has woo is gonna be so excited and energized by meeting and greeting everybody that walks through that door. On the opposite side, you have relators who are saying, oh boy, I kind of feel uncomfortable going to a big event. I just, I get nervous. I prefer to be in small groups or talking to one or two people and having a really deep conversation with them. So thinking about yourself, if you're a ministry leader, you might feel like, well, I have to be the woo. I have to meet everybody. And I also have to have one-on-one -on -one conversations, meaningful conversations with every single person. Well, if you feel like you have to be everything to everybody, guess what? You're going to be energized or you're going to be de-energized, right? You're going to be exhausted. So thinking about who are some partners in your ministry that can help you? Are there some elders or other volunteers that can help in certain aspects where you may not have those strengths? So with that, we also want to make sure that we partner up with lifestyle strengths. I'll turn it over to Scott. 
And lifestyle, why we, why we call these lifestyle strengths is because they flavor and influence how people want to live their life. So again, people with positivity, brighten the room with their smile, glass is always half full, silver lining to the cloud, and they want to bring that positivity everywhere they go to really lift up that environment. And if they're working in a negative environment where they can't use that positivity, eventually they're going to want out. So again, lifestyle strengths are how we live, how we carry forward. I have discipline, which is all about structure and routine. I, I like my routine. I like my structure. And when things are not flowing the way that I have set them out, I can, I can become very discombobulated that way. And, and, and it doesn't feel good. And people with adaptability, the exact opposite, they just go with the flow. Four hours of flex time. They love just kind of changing the schedule and they get energized by that. And again, if we don't understand strengths, my discipline and adaptability can butt heads, uh, can go against each other. But when we understand each other, it really helps to push us forward to work better together. So lifestyle, flavor, and influence how we live our lives. And then wild cards, why we call these wild card strengths, learner and communication is because technically, according to Gallup, every strength has a, a basement side, a downside, a, a hinder side. Um, we spend very little time on that downside. We'd rather focus you in on how to positively use your strengths than how not to use them. However, the way we teach wild cards is they have no downside. However, just like a wild card in any game that you play, if a two is wild, the two by itself is just simply a two, doesn't do any good. That two is only helpful when you put it with other cards or with other things to complete a straight to fill in a gap that is there to make three of a kind, uh, whatever it might be. The wild cards enhance the other strengths, enhance the other categories. So again, just to be a lifelong learner is not a strength. But when you use your learner to learn more about your strengths, help others learn their strengths, do those things, that's where it's powerful. Same thing with communication. When you're communicating mission, vision, values, strengths, et cetera, the, the purposes, that's when they're powerful. Wild cards enhance the other strengths and the other categories. And then the next category we have is problem identification, strategic ideation, intellection. And again, you'll notice some asterisks by certain strengths. What the asterisk means is that these strengths fit more than one category. So strategic and ideation are also seeing strengths as well as problem identification strengths. So people with problem identification see the real issue very quickly where then once you see that real issue, so that you're not working on symptoms, once you have the real issue, then the people with problem solving strengths are the ones that say, here's the three-step solution. So as Tiffany talked about her analytical, people with restorative, the ultimate fix it strength, they wanna fix it and fix it now. They're gonna be the ones that put together that real quick hitting, accurate solution for everyone to follow, for everyone to use and, and to lead you again, to solving the real issue that was pointed out by problem identification. Now, when you have all eight categories, understanding each other and working together, here's one way that this can all flow for a team, for a ministry, uh, for a family, whatever it might be. And we've worked with hundreds and hundreds of families and couples, and I use this uh, quite heavily with premarital counseling and marital counseling. It's just a great tool to help you to see how you fit together, how each person is so positive through their strengths, and it helps you to see people for who they really are gifted to be, who they're fearfully and wonderfully made to be, rather than who they are not. Now, when you understand, again, the eight categories, understand each other's strengths and put this together as a team, here's one way that it can all flow together. Problem identification will say, here's the real issue. And then our term that we brought out, is, again, we want you to take the term weakness out of your vocabulary, and replace it with partner up opportunities. So problem identification will say, here's the real issue. Problem solvers then will say, here's the three sub solutions. So again, problem identification wants to partner up with someone who has problem solving to say, here's the three step solution. Problem solvers then want to partner up with someone who has traction strengths to get that solution started. The traction people want to partner up with someone who has driving strengths to make sure it gets finished. The whole time the seeing will make sure it's the right step at the right time in the right order, the right place, it's aligned with mission, vision, values. The whole time the interpersonal will make sure the people are walking with, they're not falling too far behind, getting too far ahead, they're engaged in the process. The whole time the lifestyle will make sure things are done with good harmony, positivity, discipline, adaptability, whatever is needed. 
and the wild cards will enhance every step along the way. And when you have all eight categories understanding each other and working together uh, out of love for God in the unity of the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it's amazing the God-given results that come and the positive results of how we look at each other as this unified team rather than disjointed parts. It's really a powerful tool to help us step forward to serve the kingdom to a higher level. When we're using the strengths finder assessment, again, you have these 34 strengths that are broken out across our eight categories. And when we apply these eight categories along with some other combination factors that we point out, again, God really blesses those efforts in those situations. So thrilled to be here talking to you about this today. So once you have eight categories and you've got everything in place, what, what do you do from there? So you understand your strengths, you understand the eight categories. Well, what we encourage then and what we do is we break out those strengths. We put them into a team grid. So here's, here's a, a team. We took the names out to protect the innocent, so to say. So again, what you're seeing here is you're seeing a grid of a team with all of their strengths laid out. We encourage the teams bring this grid to every meeting, to every interaction, so you know people's strengths, so you can talk from those strengths, so you can partner up, so you can appreciate each other through those strengths. And so then with this color-coded grid, you'll see our eight categories color-coded up at top, attraction being green, those are the ones that get things started, green, go. Drivers are the finishers, red, you know, kind of the stop sign, purple lifestyle. So in a quick glance, a team can look at this and say, whoa, on our team, we only have one person with traction. That's pretty low. We probably want to look for other people to add to our team. And at a quick glance here, when you see the color coding too, you can see there's a predominance of purple lifestyle. So we're going to have a lot of lifestyle. Um, we've got a good number of problem solving with the white slides there. So again, at a quick glance with the colors, you can see where you have a predominance of strengths and where you need some partner up opportunities. The one time we were working with a team of 13 people. And what we realized as we worked with this team of 13 people is they had zero traction and zero driving. It was a huge aha moment for them because they're like, oh, well, it makes perfect sense. We, we come together and they had strong problem identification, strong problem solving. So they were identifying the issues. They were putting solutions out there, but then they would come back together to meet. And guess what? It's just sitting there because they had zero traction and zero driving. Didn't mean they didn't get some things started and some things finished, but they did not get a whole lot moving. And it took a lot of energy because they were working outside of their strengths. So what happened is this team added two people to their team with traction and driving. And it's amazing the God-given results that are coming through that. And it's just fun to watch them now hit those marks, have that strong problem identification, problem solving with these two new members, you know, getting it started and taking it to the finish line. Just amazing the positivity that comes with that. So you see the team grid. And then what we do is we break this into categories uh, with percentages and index. So the categories here, again, the eight categories, we break that apart and we get into, again, these percentages. A healthy, well-rounded team will be at the 90th index or better in every category. So when you look at this team that we just showed you the grid for, you're going to look at that and say, okay, so they're at the 25th index for traction, which means they're pretty low. So we want to be looking for people potentially to add to this team that have traction. What you're going to notice here too is look at that number for interpersonal, zero. So they have zero people with interpersonal strengths on the team. Doesn't mean that they don't love people. Doesn't mean that they can't work with people, but it means that they're probably going to need to add some people that have some of those interpersonals, interpersonals to make sure that they're not losing sight of the people. This group can become with the strong driving, so you're driving at 121 index, they're gonna get a lot done. So they could lose sight of people. They could become more task oriented than people oriented. So again, seeing these indexes, seeing this again, reporting mechanism helps the team to analyze itself, to rejoice. And again, how they are fearfully and wonderfully made, but also then to add from concentric circles that people say, well, who, who else do we add? We've, our staff is our staff. Well, you've got your boards, you've got congregational members, you've got all kinds of concentric circles that you can reach out to that are gonna have different strengths to bring to the table and to use. And when you go to someone and ask them to work from their strengths, it's invigorating. You're seeing them for who they're gifted to be. You're using them for their strengths. They're excited. They're more engaged as the statistics that we showed you earlier state. 
and they're more likely to be involved volunteering and being a part of what's taking place. So those are some of those stats. And again, if there's any Q&A questions out there, please shoot them forward. And then one other tool that we use in, in reporting and that you can see here and, and you can build your, your bar graphs to is just a quick snapshot of where are those strengths? Where are the predominance of those strengths? Where are we really low? Where are we at zero? And to be able to see that, share that with each other and try to bridge some of those gaps in the unity of the body of Christ. Thank you, Scott. Now, for those of you, if you have not downloaded uh, our worksheet uh, yet, I'm going to I'll actually go to the next slide just to show you a little bit about what it looks like. So we developed this worksheet to say, how can I be the best version of myself? Right. How can everybody else get the best version of me as well? So if you haven't taken the Clifton Strengths Finder assessment yet, my encouragement is that you do that to find out what your top strengths are. And for those of you who've already taken it and who know, if you know what your top five or your top eight are, uh, you can jump right into this. So BEST is an acronym to say, okay, let's, let's just focus on your number one strength. And for me, it's focus. So you'll see that example on there. So I'll say with focus, what is the benefit that I, I bring to a ministry, right? Is, what is the benefit or the value that I'm able to provide? So for me, it's I'm able to help set a goal or milestone for the team. And I help everybody take those action steps, right? I can help people reduce the overwhelm to say, don't focus on the 20 things you have going on. You know, if you want to really get traction and get that one thing started, let's really focus on that. So that's the benefit that I typically will help with a team. All right, well, now that I understand that, what environment do I need to be successful? How can I use my strength? So when we think about environment, sometimes this is a little bit confusing and it takes some reflection. So for me with focus, I need an environment that isn't disruptive so I can really focus on my goal without interruption. So I was actually working with a pastor who had the strength of focus as well. And he goes, yeah, I realize that, you know, I have, I have my week planned out. I know when I'm working on my sermon, which days, which times, and I, I let people that I work with know, don't interrupt me. I just, I really need that time, whether it's one hour or, or longer without interruption to really focus and make headway. So once you understand your strength in that environment, you can start to communicate that with other people, right? So now that I understand the benefit that I provide and the environment that I need to serve, to, to thrive in, now it kind of leads to the S or the struggle. So why might you be struggling? And at a high level, the answer is going to be because maybe you're not able to have the environment you need, right? So I may struggle if I'm routinely interrupted or if my goals keep changing, right? If I, if my email is constantly dinging, my phone is constantly ringing, okay, well, I'm I'm struggling. Now we can't control everything, but knowing that we can control some things, okay, maybe sometimes I need to turn my computer off or turn my email off, uh, turn my phone on silent so I can really work on something or communicate to other people what I need, which is where the T or the talk comes into. So who do you need to communicate, right? Is it, is it a colleague? Is it a spouse, a family member, whatever it is to say, hey, I, this is where I'm struggling. And I think this is something that I can do that can help. And, you know, I, I love your help. Maybe they're an accountability partner, or maybe you kind of feel like they're part of the problem, or they're not even aware that it's a problem and they need to understand that. So my encouragement is, you know, just work on this spreadsheet or work on this worksheet uh, with your top five or your top eight, if you have them, uh, spend some time reflecting on it and continue to use this worksheet uh, in different settings, right? Maybe you want to use it for at work and maybe you want to use it at home. Maybe you're having an issue with somebody in your family or a friend and you want to say, how does this apply and how can I maybe get to the root issue based on my strengths? And then we also add two questions on the bottom of the worksheet as well on the back page. One is to think about how can you adjust or explain your leadership approach based on your strengths to be a better colleague? And also what strengths could you use better to be a better colleague to get the most out of yourself and your peers? And really this is the idea of starting with yourself, right? Being able to understand yourself. And that's really what this is as well. So thinking of your ministry, applying this worksheet, but then after you understand and you've done some self-reflection, now it's important to kind of have that productive dialogue with your team so you can strengthen your team. So again, we want you to look at this, this discussion as this is just a stepping point. This isn't a, this was nice and I'm never gonna think about it again. Uh, we really wanna help you keep this alive. So you're creating a strengths first mindset for yourself, right? Keeping it in front of you. So then over time, the organizations that you're a part of, you're building a strengths first culture. So at a high level, how can you do that? 
First of all, it's memorizing what your top five or your top eight strengths are, right? Uh, because the more you remember it, the more then you can get into what does that mean for you? Um, so our encouragement is to post your top five or your top eight, whether if you're in the office or you know, you're in the church, put it on the wall, on your desk, maybe you're still remote, put it on your email signature. What, what's amazing about what will happen is people say, well, what does that mean? And then you might be like, oh, well, how can I put this into words, right? But then that's the encouragement for you to really say, this is the value that I'm able to bring to the group and this is what it means. And it's, it's a great time to have that discussion. So if you complete that best of me worksheet too, who do you need to share it with? Again, it can be multiple people and it doesn't always have to happen right away, right? If, you, if you're an achiever, you just wanna get it done, right? You're gonna to try to do everything and have conversations with everybody. Um, but if it feels overwhelming, don't worry about it. You know, Take it in small steps and share it with different people that need it. Encourage those that have taken the assessment to share what their strengths are and use something like the grids that we showed earlier. So for example, if I go back to this, so we'll put together a team report and we'll have this color coded. And we encourage you to take that to every single meeting that you go to. So as you're talking to somebody, you can say, oh, that's right. I, I should talk to them from their problem solving strengths. I, I should ask them, hey, I, can you help me get to the root issue? Or I wanna say this to somebody and then you have this certain in, interpersonal strength. How would you go about approaching this, right? So it's the idea again of partnering up based on strengths and having this in front of you, again, is a reminder of the team and the strengths that they have. So you can approach them and have conversations based on their strengths. And you could even think about the volunteers in your organization. I always say, if you understand their strengths, then you can start to ask them to volunteer based on their strengths, right? Uh, if you know that somebody doesn't have any interpersonal strengths, they don't necessarily want to be the one that's greeting everybody that comes into an event, right? So being aware of that, understanding their strengths. So then you can say, well, how best could you serve based on your strengths? Or how do you want to serve? As you're putting together new committees, perhaps, or new, new project teams, again, thinking about strengths to say, who do we need to bring in to this team? Because we're, we're missing certain strengths, whether it's certain specific strengths or certain categories. And then our encouragement is always, once you start to really speak this language for yourself and you start to see other people using their strengths, call them out on it, praise them, right? Nothing is better than somebody telling you did a great job and they saw you using your strengths. So with that, that is just a handful of things uh, of ways that you can create that mindset for yourself and that culture for yourself. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Scott for any other thoughts. And then again, as well, feel free to ask any questions in the chat um, or any specific questions that you may have. And we'd love to answer those with you. So there was a question on uh, where to take the assessment. And I did send that back. If you just simply go to cliftonstrengths.com, that's going to lead you to Gallup. Um, we're, we're, we're not a part of Gallup. We just take the information that's given there and do extra analysis. But if you go to cliftonstrengths.com, you can purchase your top five strengths for $19.99 uh, and get those. Or otherwise, what we encourage is just go for the full 34 to understand again where six, seven, and eight are. And it also helps to see those bottom five, six, seven strengths too, because those are ones that you just absolutely need to partner up with. My 34th strength being context. So I'm not one to look at the past to interpret the, the present to lead to the future. I need those context people to help me see that past more clearly um, to work forward that way. So uh, again, uh, take a look there. You'll see that. And then we hope and pray that the information that we shared with you today gives you a good basis to take those strengths and then look at those eight categories and to say, okay, I've got some traction strength. Well, this makes sense as to why I, I'm really good at getting things started, but I don't have any driving strengths. So I get a lot of things started. So I worked with a pastor um, who had two tra traction strengths and no driving strengths in his top eight. And he said, oh, makes perfect sense, Scott. This last year, I started 50 different things but I didn't finish anything. I said, right, right. That's where we need to partner up. We need those partner up opportunities. And so for myself, uh, again, uh, being, uh, being a uh, relator, number one, relators about very deep, close collegial relationships with just a few people. So being a former principal, always inner city, urban, Milwaukee, Atlanta, Minneapolis, uh, back to Atlanta as a professor there on different things. But uh, the stereotypical view of a principal is that they have to be outside every morning, greeting every child, greeting every family, doing those things. 
Now I could do that. I have responsibility as a strength. So people have responsibility to do what they're tasked to do, do what's in their position description. So I can do that, but I found myself being exhausted. So once I understood strengths and I understood my team, what I started to do then is I found my woo people, woo win, winning others over. They shake the hands, kiss the babies. They love doing that. So I put my woo teachers out there in the morning and they'd run up and down the street, slapping kids, high fives, greeting families. They were the best cheerleaders in the world. And then what they would do is they'd bring back those two or three families maybe that needed to go deeper. And with my relator, I could go deeper with two or three, but to go through 300 to get to those two or three, that's where I get exhausted. So again, we, we want to encourage you working from those strengths. And I saw there was a question there, Tiffany. Uh, did you answer that already? Um, uh, what? Yeah. yeah, I thought I would just share it with everybody because I think other people are thinking the same thing. Uh, the first thing is the assessment to get your full 34 is $49.99 plus tax. Uh, so you will get your full 34 report. And then the other question was, and now it's off my screen is when looking at teams. So for example, this person has a team of three, they were all staff and they do not have budget to add anybody else. So what are ways to add one of the eight categories without adding paid staff? So it's a great question. And I know that we get this a lot. So don't feel like because you have these gaps that you have to hire somebody new. Okay. So thinking about uh, if you have a staff of three, do you have volunteers that could help? Uh, do other people on your board or your elders that that could also help. So we typically will when we're working with an organization, especially a church, we'll kind of work with a few, maybe it's a pastor, the principal and a few other leaders, right? So maybe a group of five to 10. And then we'll see what those gaps are. So now we've we've identified, all right, this is what we want to be looking for. Then it's are there, are there other people that we didn't bring in on that first group, that first round? Um, are there other people that we can think of that? Hey, I bet they might have this strength based on my experience or interactions with them. You could also even go to a sp go to spouses, right? So as Scott was saying, we've worked with a lot of spouses as well. Um, so don't feel like you have to bring in somebody full time. So sometimes when you look at those gaps, so as I was mentioning for myself with my traction strengths, I know sometimes ministries have brought me in just to basically be a consultant to say, this is kind of what's going on. What are you seeing as an external consultant? So I'm giving my feedback. I'm not necessarily doing the work after that, right? I'm giving them the direction and then they feel like comfortable that now I can go about doing this myself. So those are a couple ways. Scott, are there any that I maybe missed that you'd want to bring up? I, I would just say, uh, again, um, absolutely. Those concentric circles, you know, different group members in your ministry and the community. Um, and, and I'll tell a little story about this in just a second. But the other piece that I want to add to this is you can use artificial tools um, to help you also. Um, is, so, again, if your team is lacking in traction, there are artificial tools out there like Vision Traction Organizer, um, EOS model, a strategic planning model that Grace in Action utilizes. And, and that builds in traction. That builds, it's artificial means it's never as good as someone who naturally has traction strengths, but you can use artificial tools. So if your team is lacking in interpersonal, you can use artificial mechanisms, resources, uh, means to help you fill some of those gaps. But still what's most powerful is bringing in that person who has those particular strengths in those particular categories that you might be missing. So in understanding that, I, I, I wanna stress this. So for example, I do not have any problem identification or any problem solving in my top eight strengths. It doesn't mean I can't see an issue and it doesn't mean I can't solve it. But what it means for me is I'm gonna put out five fires, seven fires, nine fires, and then someone with problem identification is gonna say, you know, instead of putting out all those fires, turn off the gas that's leaking. Okay, so they get to the real issue much quicker. It's not all about all these little fires. They get to that real issue. They use their strength to help me get to the real issue. And then the problem solvers will say, here's the three-step solution. So again, you turn the nozzle on the gas to the left, um, put a cap on it, seal it, you're done. For me, without problem solving and strong driving, strong finishing strengths, I'll get it turned off, but it's going to be nine messy steps compared to three clean steps. So why I stress that is myself not having strategic. And strategic is really good at prioritizing helping you to say yes to the right things, no to the right things, really good at prioritizing, is my daughter has strategic in her top five strengths. So I'll go to my daughter who's 22 and I'll say, help me prioritize these five, six, seven things. And she walks me through a process for how to prioritize that. She does not need to be a subject matter expert. So I'm not going to my daughter and asking her for the psychometrics behind a strengths finder assessment. That's subject matter expertise but I'm going to her for a quick hitting help in how to prioritize. 
because she has that strength of strategic. She's really good at using it. So again, if you're even a small team of two or three, look for those others, those others that you can just call a friend, whatever that you know that has that missing strength and just walk them through the situation and let them use that strength. They don't have to have that subject matter expertise, but they have expertise in how to use their strength to help you. And to again, you know, you know, complete that unity of the body of Christ. Tiffany, I see there's another question there. Uh, please pop in. Yep, yeah, I'll read it. So it says, I, I've done the strengths assessment before on a team. And when someone else shared their strengths, I thought it may, it may be their strength, but actually not, they're not very strong at their strength. What are ways you have seen teams be transparent about others, other members skill in their strength? So it's a great question. I'm working with a team right now that actually said that, that very thing where I had a few people say, I, I'm surprised this person and actually this person had the strength of strategic and nobody was seeing it. Well, what we were finding out, so when we think about strategic, strategic is more high level, quick thinking, thinking out six months to three years to say, let's what, what's that strategic plan. When somebody has strategic, they're not necessarily one to get into the weeds and work on all the day-to-day -day challenges that are going on. Well, in that person's role, that's exactly what they had to do. So it's, it's about being honest with everybody to say, hey, you know, how are you using this strength, right? So that best worksheet is a great example. So I had a conversation with the person that had strategic said, you know, fill out this worksheet. Do you feel like you're using strategic? And the person said, no, I, I don't really feel like I can. And I feel like when I bring it up, I'm silenced. You know, they don't want to hear my thoughts. So, right. So it's twofold. It's that person saying, okay, I don't really feel like I'm able to use my strength. How can I use it more? But then I'm also coaching the rest of the team that isn't seeing this in this individual to say, how can you have a conversation to say, go to them and say, all right, it's strategic specifically, <clears throat> you know, based on your strength, how are you, what, what true issues are you seeing, right? So asking specific questions about that strength and how could you use that more? And what are you seeing that could be more strategic for the organization? Uh, so it's having that objective dialogue, right? Based on strengths. It's not about a personal attack on somebody. It's saying, this is your strength. How do you see yourself using it? How do you see yourself using it more? Or do you feel like that's something that I can help you do more, right? Is it about adjusting some of that workload? So if that person is focusing on all the day-to-day -day stuff, but getting into the weeds, well, they're not able to use that strength. So is there a way where there could be some shuffling of work or whether, again, I understand that you may not be able to hire somebody new, but is there a volunteer that can help with some of that? So they're able to feel like they can use that strength more often. I hope that answers that question. I don't know, Scott, if there's more you wanted to elaborate on. Yeah, just would add, uh, thanks for the question. Um, this is something that comes up, has come up over the last 10, 15 years that I've worked with strengths. And again, remember the pyramid that we all need to be healthy, built on those solid values, uh, those, those positive virtues being shown. And again, being healthy spiritually, emotionally, physically. If, if we're working with people that are struggling in those areas, and, and that's okay to struggle in those areas. We, we all have times and moments where we struggle. But we need to be having those good conversations with each other too. How are, you, how are you doing spiritually? How are you doing emotionally? How are you doing physically? And then looking at how can I strengthen my strengths? And, and through all of those pieces coming together and, and God at the center of this and his love guiding us, there are definitely ways to help people grow, to thrive, and to, to really use those strengths even, even better, more effectively, more efficiently. Uh, as Tiffany said, that best worksheet is a great way to start that dialogue too, to dig deeper into those strengths to see how we can better utilize them. So great, great question with that. And again, as we've worked with, uh, like I said, hundreds and hundreds of teams and thousands of individuals through this, it is such a powerful, positive tool to help people again, to, to begin to look at each other for who they're really gifted to be rather than who they're not. Being a former principal teacher uh, on a daily basis, I can tell you that education approaches, uh, approaches children many times in the wrong way. If we have a student that is really gifted at reading and not good at math, what do we do? We give that student who's really gifted at reading less reading, what they love to do, their strength, and we give them a thousand math problems every day and we wonder why they hate coming to school. The point being is we should build through the strength. I'm not saying don't teach that child math, but build it through their strength. So again, if that child is really good at reading, build in word problems, um, geocaching, real life mathematical situations that they're through that strength of reading can have that direct application in use. It may take a little bit more upfront effort and time, but in the end, the lasting results are really powerful. 
So again, it's really building upon who we're all gifted and fearfully and wonderfully made to be, as God tells us in Psalm 139, to build upon that, to do the good works that God has prepared in advance for us to do, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, and doing that through the unity of the body of Christ, the team that we're meant to be. None of us were ever created to be alone. We need each other. So we pray again that this foundation today, that the information used, use the eight categories, take a look at your strengths, take a look at your team, analyze each other in, in a positive way and see what you're all gifted to do and how we can better put this together, realign position descriptions, all of those different things too, because it makes, it makes a huge difference. So thank you for that. And I think there may be a couple of the comments there. Uh, yes. My pastor's strength is one-on-one -on -one care relationships. It is not preaching his own words. He said that. Is he in the wrong role or is it simply every job has things people are bad at? His just happens to be in public. It's a terrific question. So I, I worked with another pastor who really felt the exact same way. And what he did is he had more of his elders coming up and speaking in, in front of groups and, and doing more of this. And he, he really added diversity to the service. He went to much shorter speaking um, pieces, you know, a three minute uh, type of sermonette here, three minute educational piece there. Um, they revamped things to work with that. Um, now, in the end, you want to take a look at that, too, that anyone can speak, but speaking from your strengths is what's powerful. So there may be some coaching that could come in with that pastor too, to say, how can I better speak from my strengths? I worked with a pastor who had competition, number one is a strength. And when he preached from remembering how his soccer team as a kid won and these things, it was just powerful. But when he, when he would try to speak outside of those strengths, the things that just weren't as comfortable, it didn't come as naturally. So there may be simple things like that. And again, I don't want to give you the 100% answer here one way or the other. And, and also, just to be honest, there are going to be times and moments where we all have to work outside of our strengths, times and moments. So, for example, myself not having Wu as a principal, I had to meet and greet everyone at graduations, spring programs, etc. And I did it, and I was good with it, but I was exhausted after because I was working outside of my strengths. So you do have to evaluate after a while, how much is it asking you to work outside your strengths, how much, and, and can you realign that, can you fix that? Can you, can you make that to, so that it's more in the strengths so that you're working less out of those strengths? So that's a very long answer to a very, uh, very multi-tiered question. I love the question. And I'm happy to talk offline more about that at any point in time too. You have our contact information here. Don't hesitate to reach out to us and you know, give some other positive uh, thoughts to those situations. So thank you for that question. Uh, thank you for some kind words out there. We, we again pray that this presentation is a blessing to all of you and that you can take this forward to serve your ministries, your people, the kingdom to a higher level. So thank you uh, for that. With that being said, Tiffany, any closing thoughts from you? Nope. Uh, I, I guess we'll, I'll just reiterate what, reiterate what it says on here. Thank you for all your participation. I really want you to, again, think about taking weakness out of your vocabulary, replacing it with partner up opportunities, right? What benefits you bring and how can you partner up with others to bless, continue to bless each other? And we are here, you know, stand ready to serve. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to either of us. I uh, would be happy to continue the conversation and thanks for uh, attending Siebert's conference this year. It was, it was a great one. Thank you. And Lene, uh, I guess maybe we turn it back over to you. We're at, I think, 12.03, 12.04, and I know we're supposed to be done at 12.05. So, Lene, any, anything else from us or any, any closing thoughts from you? No, thank you, everyone, for today's session. Again, the recording will be available within two weeks of today, and you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Scott, yeah. and Tiffany as well. We appreciate it. Thank God's you. blessings, everyone. Take care. Thank you.